Let's see. Welcome everybody to the Regeneration Podcast uh, here on, we're recording on October 30th. And uh, usually Michael Martin, because he's tied to the land, has a little bit of an update on what's going on with uh, regenerative agriculture, biodynamic agriculture in Southern Michigan. What's going on, my friend? Uh, uh, today, I went out in, to frost, which, which is about Killer normal. Frost. Killer little, frost? It wasn't a hard frost, but it was a little bit of frost. Mm -hmm. The day after Michaelmas, which, you know, we had our big Michaelmas festival here on the farm on Tell Sunday. us how it went. <clears throat> it was great. Um, I was surprised that a lot of people showed up and it was, you know, sketchy weather. It looked like it was going to rain. In fact, it, there was intermittent rain throughout the day. So uh, one of my friends who <laughs> showed up, we're using the cloud buster. And I said, I'm not saying yes. I'm not saying no. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Just to know. But uh, it was very nice. It was very nice. Maybe about... 35 people here were here. I think that's great. A few children. Yeah. There's no way to regenerate the uh, the liturgical year, the, the year of festivals without doing it on your own. I give you a lot of credit for single-handedly just starting Michael Miss and May Day festivals in your yard. Yeah, so so what we did, <coughs> pardon me, is uh, we have this like a parade with a dragon. All the children are the dragon. We, in fact, my, my two youngest sons and I made a really cool dragon head out of paper mache and the skin is basically sheets painted green and other things which uh all the other children were behind and then we had saint michael who slew the dragon or did he win it. again this year i hope so he wins every year awesome awesome i get nervous and every then year. we had this big feast kind of thing potluck and people were drinking my mead awesome that really strong one I told you about, uh, which was, we sang. And we sang a song, I'll just do a little bit right. of it. Uh, Mark knows, our guest today, Mark Vernon, and you probably know Mike. Well, and it goes like this. And it does second verse which answers all the questions and it's why, great. why do we why did i mention that because mark like mike and myself is a is a is a huge fan of, of the patron saint of jesus the imagination William Blake. yeah we'll mention that uh michael martin we didn't mention this mark and i'll introduce you a little more fully that uh Michael's the editor, and I'm a frequent contributor to a journal he started, kind of to the arts and imagination, called Jesus the Imagination. So, you know, heading, jumping right in, I'm going to welcome our guest, Mark Vernon, all the way from the UK. Mark is a writer and a commentator, and I'm reading off the uh, the bio of his, uh, an excellent book that could be several, several podcasts in itself. Owen Barfield, I'm just so conversant with him. And we'll get to why, for some reason, I wanted to talk to you about William Blake mostly, but the secret history of Christianity. Um, Mark is a writer, a commentator, and a psychotherapist contributing to and presenting programs on BBC radio, as well as writing for the national and religious press and online publications like Aeon. More on that and on from me. Uh, he has a PhD in ancient Greek philosophy and other degrees in physics and theology, having studied at Durham, Oxford, and Warwick universities, author of several books, including The Meaning of Friendship, God, the Big Questions, the Idler Guide to Ancient Philosophy, and more, and a most recent one on Dante. Uh, welcome, Mark Vernon. Hey, look, thank you very much. And greetings from William Blake's land, uh, not yeah. just England's green and pleasant land, but actually I live in South London, you know, within walking distance of Lambeth, where he and Catherine lived for probably their happiest years. 
Um, Walking distance. So, yeah, so I probably got into Blake because I feel like he's our local mystic. Um, yeah. And wanted to understand him better. And I'm correct in, in saying you've not written a book on Blake. Do you plan to write a book on Blake? You're so excellent on him, and I'll say more about that. Yeah, I, I'm getting there. I've been, you know, reading and thinking and doing a podcast and then this essay, you know, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's my way of seeing whether I really feel I can get to the heart of what he's on about, which isn't straightforward, actually. Oh. And <laughs> To say and the then, very least. Um, you know, then whether I feel I can actually write about it at book length, which, of course, is something else again. Right, um, but I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, feeling maybe I can, so... I hope you do because you don't seem repetitive at all. And I think you have a book's, a book's worth of insights. There's one, there's one place in one article I read too, and you've read more of the secondary literature. And I'll mention a little bit to my, my interest in you and Blake. Um, the secondary literature I've read, and I almost think everybody reads a lot of secondary literature because the material is so difficult, would be Peter Ackroyd's biography. And then I've mentioned in this podcast before, I'm probably on my fourth round of reading Northrop Fry's book, Fearful Symmetry. And then, and then your stuff online, it seems irreplaceable for me. And two things. One is your background in theology and the fact that you're a psychotherapist to me. When I wonder why this guy, Mark Vernon, seems to be able to like make things so clear that are so difficult. Yeah. I swear that it has to do with the yeah. psychotherapist meets religion piece. But you also say, and I just don't know enough to know this, that many writers miss the spiritual component a lot. Is that a fact? It seems to me... Uh, incomprehensible that you could read Blake without the spiritual component. Now, again, Northrop Fry had a degree in divinity and was a minister. You have backgrounds in theology. B begin by saying a little bit about that, then I'm going to seed you with some of the ways we're going to unpack Blake this morning. Yeah, look, just one more person that I Please. should mention, because she's been very influential, is Kathleen Rain, um, the oh, poet. of course. And uh, she probably understood Blake even more than Northrop Fry. Okay. Um, I mean, Northrop Fry is brilliant, but sometimes his his book can be almost as complicated as Blake's poetry. Um, but <laughs> Kathleen Wayne had a way of penetrating through to the heart of Blake. I think um, uh, so. She, I, 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 I said, and the, the, you can listen to talks of hers as well as read her books as well. So she's really good. Yeah, um, so important to mention her. Yeah, uh, but yes, I, I mean, I, I kind of, um, I think that Blake. You know, he he wants to awaken us again to the inner life, not just of the psyche, the personal psyche, but the in, inner life of the whole world. Um, yeah. And um, so trying to sort of use the organs of perception that you develop as a psychotherapist, but through particularly Blake's poetry to see whether you can follow his golden thread um, and, you know, feel um, what he saw, I think, quite routinely. Um, mm -hmm. and what it means for now. Um, he's also a very sharp thinker, so that appeals to me too. There's another uh -huh. side of him that's often lost. His, his couplets can be um, uh, sort of, they, they um, belie the amount of thought that goes into them, I think, and then bang, you know, he, he hits the nail on the head again. Um, so um, it's, it's the religious side, but also him as a thinker. You know, he's often talked about as a great political figure, and, you know, and did those feet in, in ancient land is a great political anthem often sung as. Um, and then also as a great creative um, and how his imagery has sparked a thousand comic strips and whatever else, you know. Um, but I think that people, because they're in his sort of single vision or maybe dual vision, um, they just perhaps even don't see the religious side to him. Extraordinarily odd, though, that can sound i mean people do the same with dante actually last yeah. year um was the 700th anniversary of dante's divine comedy mm -hmm. and in a leading magazine here in the uk they had a kind of front page cover story on dante and the academic that wrote it even made the comment at one point <coughs> some people say dante's divine comedy is a religious text as if this was you know a, a sort of footnote <laughs> that you might want to pick up if you're that way inclined talk um, about burying the lead as they say right i know and it's not like these guys here <coughs> like in metaphor both dante and blake say this is about finding heaven or jerusalem or whatever you know um yeah. so yeah it's 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 part of this i think it must just wash over people and because they don't know what to make of it. They hardly even notice that it's there. It's, it's, it's quite a big comment, I think, actually, on what it is to live in a very secular age like ours. 
Yeah, you know, and the uh, you mentioned awakening, you know, that you also say, and it's a it's a really concise summary of even maybe the way Michael and I we haven't talked about this, but the way we are you know almost trying to change the musical register of the way people feel religion, you know. But you'll say that Christianity, or Blake will say it's not about sin; it's about sleep, right? And there again is this notion of awakening as opposed to doing like right and wrong, foundational to William Blake. Michael, jump in here a little bit. Then we're going to set off Mark Vernon on some of his, uh, the oh, yeah. stuff he does so well. Well, I, I you know, um, what really strikes me, and I think Mark's the perfect person to talk to about this. One thing we mentioned last time in our introduction to William Blake is what a tremendous psychologist he was. And we talked in Jerusalem in particular, uh, even in the Songs of Innocence and Experience, where he examines the same question from, from two different perspectives very often. But in Jerusalem, you know, with the, the tearing off of the specter and the tearing off of, of the emanation, which is, when you read it, I mean, really attentively, I'll, I mean, I just, I would get chills reading it because it felt like it was something going on inside of me. And I could identify with you can, and you can see why so many Jungians uh, read Blake and they go and they look at him and think, "Wow, this guy got it. This is he's he's exactly describing what what happens with with uh, the projection of the anima, for instance, or whatever it happens to be." But but to me, uh, and I think Peter Ackroyd, I saw an interview with him. He he thinks William Blake was the most brilliant man ever to come out of Britain, which I and I think. There's a case to be made for that. And uh, Certainly, you know, I think. Or, I mean, I, my, my doctorate is in, in British literature and, uh, you know, in poetry in particular, but I, I would be hard pressed to find someone more uh, extraordinary than William Blake, who is almost entirely ignored in his lifetime, which is shocking. Yeah, actually, you mentioned Peter Ackroyd because his. His biog there, you know, which you say is a, 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 a must go to text. But actually, I really like Peter Ackroyd too, because he, although I don't know, he, I don't think he knows quite what to make of the religious side of Blake. But nonetheless, he's, he is open to it. And he, he doesn't try to argue away the fact that Blake, you know, lived with the dead and with the angels, um, with all sorts of things like that. He, he's quite open to all that, actually. Um, and so at least um, he doesn't just close it down or say, you know, if only Blake was put in a brain scanner, we'd understand what was going on, which is what a lot of people today say. Yeah. I'm almost getting chills with this conversation again, because it's, yeah, it's, it's you're though, so good on this. It's as though people want to psychoanalyze Blake when actually what he's doing is psychoanalyzing us. Right. <laughs> and and looking at Blake through the realm of Olro, you know, should be a whole book on Blake of all these people who are uh, missing <laughs> missing the thing that's right there. So, you know, on that note, you know, going through your work, Mark, uh, your videos, and I hope at a time, you know your language best because you're kind of on YouTube. There's some written things. I'm going to mention an article on Aeon Magazine that's seminal. Um, but what I think you do, you do so many things so well with William Blake. Um, and again, we're not even touching your book on Barfield that I feel is monumental and so forth, is that you take these four states of awareness these four states of existence for William Blake, Ulro, Generation, Beulah, and Eden. And then only this morning, revisiting so much of your work and your essays, did I realize, and it's so useful for young people or anybody, to see how these kind of, they're kind of states of awakening, and that to see how you use these states of awareness to say how differently we can look at certain things like death, the whole uh, ecology movement, you know, uh, the, the way we look at the material universe and the way we look at freedom. I want to throw it to you, Mark, first. I mentioned four, death, ecology, material universe. In order to get your pumped prime, did you want to launch out on one of those? That's just kind of something that feels like you would like to explain it to us. Yeah, so this is my way of, I mean, not just mine, actually, but um, it's one way of trying to put together a framework when you're reading, say, the epic poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, which uh, Michael referenced there, um, in order to have a bit of a map to at least then try and get in direct contact with the terrain of the poem, if you like. Um, so it's, it's always a bit artificial with Blake because ultimately he wants you to be absolutely in contact with reality and moving with the reality around you, which I think is why 
his poems can be so confusing um, because they're not, it's, you know, Dante's Divine Comedy, has, it's, it's a difficult text, but at least you know the story. Um, yeah. You know, it begins in hell, goes through purgatory, up to paradise kind of thing. Um, and that, that can keep you going. Whereas with Blake, particularly the epic poems uh, towards, you know, the second half of his life, um, they're, they're moving around quite as much as one's own mind can move around. Um, but he's, he's always wanting us to, he, it's almost like a training, I think. I mean, he does say, I give the end of a golden string, only wind it into a ball. You know, mm -hmm. it'll lead you in at Heaven's Gate built in Jerusalem's wall. And so he really is wanting to cleanse the doors of perception. So use another well-known phrase. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in a way, I think when you can read a poem like Jerusalem, and be with it every step of the way is probably when you're seeing what Blake saw directly yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's a long way of saying that these, but there are these four kind of, as you say, stages of awakening that he often refers to. Um, and they're sometimes known as single vision, you know, twofold vision, threefold vision, fourfold vision as well. Um, and the, the all rose state, if it's useful just to give a very short sort of summary is um, where everything is abstract. Um, everything is numbers, statistics, um, and in a way, it's the state which is out of touch with reality in the sense that it's confused the abstract with reality itself. Um, and the famous images that he has of that are either of a kind of Newton, of course, or, Eurizen, yeah. or Newton. He blames Newton a lot, probably unfairly, actually, but nonetheless, he blames Newton a lot. Um, and where the map with the compasses open on the map of the complete preoccupation. Um, and it's, you've almost sort of forgotten that you're in the living world. And, you know, scientism would be the way we might put that now. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, a, I have a, a literary hero friend who died recently, Stephen Visenchy, who actually lived in London. But he had a great phrase that I thought got the distinction between oro and uh, vision. But he said, it's like confusing a woman's glance with saying she had 20-20 vision. You know, a woman's glance at her husband when you're in the doghouse is relational. It's, it's filled with emotional content, you know, and then reducing it to saying she had 20-20 vision is a great example. It captures this notion of reducing something to all row, you know. Yeah. I mean, a quick way, a quick example, um, which I, I've used in the essay as well, is, is how you see the sun in these different states of awakening. Because Say everything about that. Yeah. So, so Blake's well known for saying, you know, having this conversation with himself one day when he, um, when someone... Um, you know, hypothetically asks him, you know, what do you see when you see the sunrise? Do you see a guinea, um, a golden guinea, you know, um, I looks like a, a sort of small disc in the sky and Blake responds, no, 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 I see the heavenly hosts crying, holy, holy, holy. So how you see the sun is quite a good measure of, of, of where you are on these stages of awakening. And in the all rose state, it would be just described a bit like in a, a, a kind of catalog of stars um, by an astronomer, it would be like an E-type average yellow star halfway through its lifetime in a, a, a an inconsequential part of the Milky Way galaxy um, you know it would be pretty uninteresting and, and, and dull really um, just one of countless stars like that that's how all row would categorize our star um, whereas generation the next stage and, and the other thing that's really nice about Blake is that there's, there's instabilities within all these stages so that if you can track the instability which is sort of to undergo the crisis and the suffering associated with each stage it can lead you to the next and the obvious one with a statistical life is it's actually a dead life when you're actually alive so it's you know it, it, one way or another um it it, it, it leads you our elsewhere. fascination with the zombies right mark yeah yeah no exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah that's a very good point yes mm -hmm. um Sort of projecting out our all row state onto these. The fantastic. world is all row, and all we do is watch zombie movies. Yeah, to look yeah, in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in generation, life starts <laughs> to reappear, but it's quite a sort of biological life, and hence the notion of generation. It's um, it's mostly interested in replication, um, self-sustaining, safety. Um, so you know, you might say um, a lot of our anxiety about death, which we've become so conscious of through COVID. Um, we're trying to wrestle with that in a generation state. And so the medicalization of the problem becomes the absolutely fundamental and crucial approach. Um, and in terms of seeing the sun um, in generation, you start to clock that energy comes from the sun and that energy comes to earth and causes life 
Um, and so you might start to get concerned about things like pollution. But again, it would still be um, in a very scientific sort of frame, um, quite instrumental. The sun would be treated as, um, you know, we needn't worry about the sun burning out because it's still got billions of years to go. But we might worry about the sun overheating the planet through global warming. Um, those kind of concerns would come to the fore in generation. Um, but, you know, we are meaning seeking creatures um, and um, the sun um, doesn't just provide us with energy and heat, but it kind of looks beautiful. Few people would die that, uh, deny that the sun can look beautiful. Um, and so that's leading us into what Blake called Beulah. Um, and Beulah, it comes, the word comes from um, the Hebrew Bible where um, one of the prophets says, you know, my land shall be called Beulah. Um, and it's a state where the meaning of things, the soulfulness of things comes to the fore. Um, you know, so you'll want to look at a beautiful image of the sunset um, and you'll say, you know, what an amazing thing that this object in the sky um, that's otherwise just an astronomical body nonetheless seems to look so wonderful and inspire so much poetry. And, um, you know, people feel better when they're warmed by the sun. Um, so th this sort of is, is going on in the in the state of Beulah. But Beulah is also quite a dreamy state. Um, so it, it pulls you towards the fourth fourfold vision um, in almost in your dreams about the sun. You might say you wonder, um, you know, is there more that I can know about this as well? Um, that'd be one facet of Beulah. Um, and so that would lead to Blake's notion of eternity or Eden. He sometimes calls it as well. And this is fourfold vision. And this is when you, I mean, to cut to the chase, not just the sun, but in everything, you can see the divine presence. Mm -hmm. um, and so hence him seeing the ho heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy. Um, you know, one way or another, you are able to perceive, and it's perception that counts so much for Blake, I think, um, uh, that um, the divine life is... Um, shining, radiating, um, reaching you, but also welling up from within you. Um, and uh, the sun, um, you know, hence sings to him, even as he's singing of the sun and, and so on. Um, yeah, so th there's these kind of four stages um, from the cosmos being dead to the cosmos being fully alive. And then how you move through them and what it takes to develop, particularly the imagination, um, in order to, to get the, the movement um, and then receive um, as well as participate um, in these uh, different uh, awarenesses of things. Um, that, that's, a, that's one way of trying to get into Blake. Yeah, no, fascinating, you know, and we're gonna, I think we're gonna have you sing that tune again for death. But uh, Michael, you know, you'd be no foreigner to this. You know, we met probably through my review of your book called The Submerged Reality. And I wrote a review of that. And again, what I appreciated in your use of sophiology and um, that book was that you, you would even find in von Balthasar, but certainly Rudolf Steiner and others, you know, that Christianity, you know, Michael, in your own work ties into perception, right? Instead of this bland theology, how about a theology that raises <clears throat> perception? We can see these things. It's not this blind faith, you know. And I'm sure, you know, I that seed was planted by William Blake when I read when I read Jerusalem when I was 22. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And then later confirmed by Trump, Thomas Traherne. <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. Well, I think has a, has a, he he sees the same thing that Blake sees. I think. Yeah. No. It's very <laughs> true. Yeah. Yeah. No. Another. I mean, he's not nearly so well known as Blake, but definitely is onto the same um, thing. Yeah. And and seeing Christianity in that way very much yeah. too. Yeah. Again, not about sin. You know, because Blake. You know, what, use your own words, uh, Mark, about distinguishing a, a religion that's looking at sin and not sin, moral codes, right and wrong, versus um, a way, maybe a cultivation practice that's about waking up, you know? Mm. So this is this is where Blake starts to get a bit challenging rather than just seeming rather lovely. <laughs> it's um, always an understatement when we say Blake gets a bit challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because one of the things which he's really against is morality. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about the wastes of the moral law. And the reason why he's so against this is because he's seen in his time, and I think this is very dominant still in a lot of Christianities that I come into contact with, um, where it's reduced to a kind of ethical framework mm -hmm. and it wastes life because it becomes a question of living by the rule or avoiding guilt um, or doing what you kind of 
feel you ought to do because there's an ideal version of you somewhere in front of you that you're constantly failing to reach. Um, and um, but the, the, the complication is that, of course, morality ethics arises with very good intent because it seeks to preserve that which it perceives to be good. Um, but it's very different from trying to preserve something which becomes desperate one way or another, as opposed to participating in it. Um, and so knowing it directly um, as part of the, your immediate life. And um, when in a way, morality ceases to matter um, because the good, the beautiful and the true has kind of come together in your being. Um, yeah, so um, that that's one of the places where he starts to get awkward um, because, you know, for a lot of Christians and for good reason too, things like social justice, um, you know, how you behave, um, you know, even, you know, references like love thy neighbor can be reduced to moral um, imperatives. Um, whereas I think what Blake would say, Jesus was really saying when he said things like love thy neighbor is, is can you see the divine in them as much as the divine in you? So again, it's Amen. really a question of perception. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah. I think uh, St. Augustine, when, when he wrote that love God and do what you will, there should have been a footnote, see William Blake for more. Because it's really it's what he's doing, and I and I think we talked last week. You know the the line from the marriage of heaven and hell that that prisons are built with the stones of law and, and brothels with the bricks of religion. That's what he's talking about. Is how the struck you know the the uh, the visionary impulse gets distorted by in the imposition of rules, the laws which then become perverted on themselves. They kind of get turned on themselves and they create the very thing they were trying to avoid. And I think you see, I mean, I, one place, Mike, Mike and I come from a Catholic background, one place you see this, you know, <laughs> unvarnished is in the, the pre-sex scandal, right? It's what happens. I mean, it's, it's in an infantilization of people. And Blake was, was asking us as to, to, to learn how to see instead how, how to read the law. And, and instead of doing midrash, to actually have immediate vision, immediate experience. And I think that's a, that's a challenge, but I think, I think it, it, it's both, and like you said, it's, there, there's, there are dangers implicit there for people who aren't quite up to the task, you know, who, who, you know, we saw this in the 17th century with the antinomians, right? Where uh, they just thought everything, you know, all the, the law doesn't matter. The, the law was displaced. And so they were engaging all kinds of despicable behavior. <laughs> and then, but Blake is, is coming from a different place. And as we know, as much as he, didn't like con that kind of conventional morality he still practiced it you know yeah. you know he, he, people talk about him as a possible of free love well, he, well in theory he was but he wouldn't do that to his wife right to Catherine. no i think that you're right it's so good it's, to bring so up any, the answer. Complicated... sorry michael i was jumping in there but i don't want to lose yeah. the antinomian moments <laughs> i think that's a really important point you make there yeah he's not an antinomian um, you know, so he, he'll say, you know, like in another phrase, um, every kindness is a little death. Um, so he's he's absolutely clear that kindness, forgiveness, compassion and so on, love are absolutely crucial. Um, but because they take you out of yourself and so make you realize there's more than yourself. So, again, it's a perceptual um, mm -hmm. drive that makes these things really crucial, um, not a moral imperative. And I think that all that stuff. Um, about you know was Blake members of the you know Moravian free love sex or whatever um, you know th those things were around I don't doubt that but it's to try and put him into a box I think that often happens when people conclude that um, he must have been um, with you know doing that as well um, and and completely misunderstands what he's actually driving at. Isn't it true too you know there's a couple things one is that it might have been E.P. Thompson uh the one of the great British historians, you know, I guess wrote a book on Blake. I think I read a lot of it, but he, you know, in a materialist view of history. So I'm going to say this was communist, not as a point to denigrate him, you know, but a materialist worldview trying to explain 
Blake, who was sui generis, you know, just tried to find the lineage that could describe Blake and ultimately failed. Right. And I, I love that so much, you know, looking at these, the, the brethren and so forth, the, or the Muggletonians and seeing if that could describe where he was. But related to this is uh, there's always been a little gem and there's many of them in the Catholic tradition, but St. John of the Cross, and I don't know if I have the wording exactly right. He said, you know, it's not our virtues and our vices that define us. It's our distance between both our, it's our distance from our virtues and our vices, right? That kind of gives us the freedom. So this thing has always been there since the gospel. But again, we get so nervous. But, you know, bringing in Mark, you know, what Michael was saying and about the uh, antinomians, let's say in, I don't know if you still do private practice with psychotherapy. How do you work with this for somebody who's bound? You know, so I, I, in the Catholic faith, if I took five young people who expressed interest in joining the Catholic faith for a severely, severely obsessive compulsive disorder, like a clinical um, how do you, as an individual, if somebody was looking at themselves being kind of burdened by the moral code, um, you know, and again, somebody who really suffers with OCD looks at the Catholic faith and it's an attraction like flies to shit, right? There's this thing that will tell me to say these prayers on a Monday, these prayers on a Friday, you know, and these at this time, how do you guide somebody to, from sleeping to awakening or from slavery to freedom? I'm asking, you know, that's a big question. I hadn't formulated it well, because I hadn't thought of it, but it's so urgent, urgent for young people today. So if you could wax on that in some way. Well, I mean, I'm uh, guiding someone from slavery to freedom. I wouldn't want to claim that, um, <laughs> but uh, accompanying people why they ha when they try, you know, to find what that might look like, um, you know, yes. And um, I think actually on, on this psychotherapy, on the whole, I mean, psychotherapy is a pretty diverse thing, but certainly the way that I think about it um, is um, actually quite aligned to Blake's understanding of the gospel at this point, because another quote, which you'll no doubt know, is words to the effect of, I, only, I know only one gospel, um, the, the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what Blake means here is that you're forgiven. That's the starting point. Um, it's not like something that comes down the line if you do the right things or attend the right rituals or, or go to confession or whatever. Um, no, you're already forgiven. The question is, what are you going to do now? Um, and psychotherapy is quite like that in a way, because someone will come and, you know, and maybe um, either be suffering from guilt or maybe even have done, you know, bad things. Um, and you're saying, look, for this hour that we're talking, that's forgiven. but because that creates the space to try to understand what's going on and how you are enslaved or trapped or, um, you know, what's um, holding you in these kind of vices. Um, mm -hmm. And with that possibility of understanding, seeing again, you know, it's, it's seeing with the inner eye, comes the possibility of awakening um, and new virtues, um, you know, being kindled. And um, so the path to freedom might be found. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's confusing this in the church, isn't it? Because sometimes, I mean, I've asked priests about this and sometimes they'll say, well, that's why the confession's at the beginning of the service, because, um, you know, you, you receive the forgiveness and then off you go into the praise and whatever else. Um, and so, but I'm not sure it quite functions like that in people's minds. Um, and, uh, you know, just it's so much um, in, in terms of church going can reinforce the sense that you you've sort of fallen short and um you know you've got to kind of deal with the falling short again and again and again and again um and and blake would say you know no um you've got to move on from that um and uh, this is partly what he's trying to foster in his poetry and so on as well that's that's, oh, his, that's, starting, that's one of my, my takeaway the first time i read jerusalem all those years ago was that it was a book about forgiveness you know, because you know, because you know, I mean, he, <clears throat> he he brings in all the people who were his enemies in real life, or who were felt persecuting him, or, or even who brought him to, to court, and they all they're all brought together in the tremendous act and movement of forgiveness. Which, and I was mentioning last time, maybe Mark knows these people. Remember, Mike, I was talking about uh, there was this this group trying to put this film together about Blake. 
I found yeah, it. Finally. Yeah. Okay. In Sussex is the project. Do you know about this, Mark? No, I don't. No. They had uh, I because I maybe two years ago I found this beautiful little one minute, two minute clip uh, that they made. I think to promote the the financing of Blake, the little boy. So many films through, start and end at that stage. Though, going, right? going through the going through uh, a field near Lambeth, and when he has the vision of being of the tree full of. <laughs> It's extraordinary. Um, and I hope they get the. I hope they make the film because it. My my God, isn't this the film we need today? A film about you know no one's made anything decent about William Blake, and you would think this is this is such rich territory for 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 cinematography alone, right? So now that they have the CGI, yeah. they represent some of those visions. But, I, but it's yeah, check it out. So it's Blake in Sussex, they have a website or a YouTube page. Yeah. And, and Mark, you know, regarding this forgiveness piece too, you know, you had mentioned the one quote from Blake, the other one, and I probably have them mixed up, the bread and the wine, but you know, um, I forgive you, you forgive me. This is the bread, this is the wine. You know, the Catholic Church is going through in the US this three year of Eucharistic revival. You know, it, I'm, <laughs> I can go off on it. You know, the, you have the pre scandals. And then the answer is more priestcraft, possibly, right? But let's give it a favorable interpretation. Could you could you flesh that out for somebody, like how that forgiveness piece ties into the Eucharist? You you were once a, a vicar in the Anglican Church. Yes, um, I mean, with in in relation to to Blake, I think that he would say um, the fix that certainly sacramental churches have gotten themselves into is that they've forgotten that the sacraments, particularly of communion, bread and wine, should be a prompt to remember that everything is sacramental. Um, Amen. And the priest, in a way, is there to say, you don't actually really need a priest. Um, I'm just here to- Amen, um, amen. <laughs> to, to, I, I perform a few rituals that bless these particular things, but that's only to show you that everything is blessed already. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that's, again, quite a challenging thing to say. That's um, where I always quote uh, Charles Williams quoting Coventry Patmore, that the Eucharist was a meal so that every meal might become a Eucharist, right? Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, no, that's absolutely right. But um, do they really kind of follow that through? Um, and, um, you know, I think it's, I don't know quite how it is in the Catholic Church, but certainly in the Anglican Church, Church of England, I think in retrospect, what was called the parish communion or the parish Eucharist movement, I think it was, but where the idea was that um, every Sunday would become a Eucharist. And the idea was that this would become much more participative and so on. And so it has a good impulse. Um, but it's become a bit of a, a sort of monocrop Christianity now where all you do is kind of take communion and then take communion again and take communion again. Um, so that sounds a bit derogatory, but... No, it's, know, it's spot on, you know, sadly. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think we, we need... To, another thing that Blake's yeah. really good at, um, which it, I don't know if you've heard this, this expression, it's been used a bit here by some people, is to rewild Christianity. Mm -hmm. And by that, they mean, yeah. you know, to get... But it's a bit like you were talking about at the beginning there, Michael, um, you know, for remembering Michaelmas, is to to remember the stories, to remember the local myths, to go to the holy well, to um, light the fires, you know, to keep the angels commemoration days and to diversify um, again and, and start to realize that that's um, the ways in which God is found everywhere, um, not yeah. just through this one particular act. Well, I, I wrote a couple of blog posts about this maybe a year or two ago, about rewilding the church. And often, if you probably know, this a lot of people interpret rewilding the church as not letting not cutting the grass around the parish <laughs> <laughs> yeah regenerative agriculture around the parish church okay, okay. that's it's a nice thing yeah. it's a nice move i appreciate that but that's not what i'm talking about um yeah so it's and i think i'm i'm totally with you on this mark i mean i this is I, I, but i've been working toward for i don't know since I started thinking about writing the submerged reality, you know, which came, which really came out of my study of 17th century sociology of Burma and the Philadelphian society and, and so forth. And, I, and Henry Vaughan and Thomas Vaughan. And, and I remember thinking someone should write a book about this. <laughs> no one's ever written a book about this. It ended up being the book I wrote. 
Send Mark a copy, and, Mike. Mike. I will. Yeah, very good book. Very good. That's how we met. Yeah. Well, now here, now I don't want to change gears too quickly, but there is something. We, now, Mark mentioned Kathleen Rain earlier. And I remember, that, you know, I'm sure Mark has a copy of Blake and Tradition, the two volume set, which I, as a 23 or 24 year old, I had to save up money to get that. They had it at a used bookstore for, I don't know, $80, even way back then. So I saved up my money <laughs> and, I, and I bought this used copy of Blake and Tradition, which you know, Kathleen Rain, I think, showed me how to be a literary critic. Because she, you know, most, you know, in my English degrees, literary criticism was was basically ripping on the dead white men. You know, it was deconstructive. But here's Kathleen Rain with this almost Coleridgean kind of approach to showing us the wonders that are inside of poetry. And uh, now, in, in, we mentioned Jesus, the Imagination, the journal I edit. Uh, which the, when the first one came out, so this is six years ago, um, I, I maybe a few months after it came out, I received a gift in the mail, which was uh, a, a copy of Temenus, is that, if I, I pronounce that correctly, which uh, it, I don't know how, but somehow Jesus, the imagination got into their hands. And I, and, and I think at the time, it also got into Prince Charles's hands. Um, and Prince Charles, I mean, now King Charles, right? Is somebody you would think, at least in, in my long history of knowing about him, uh, would be all in on what we're talking about right now. Um, and, and in fact, when Mary Grove College raised work closed, I was looking for a new job. <clears throat> One of the first places I applied was the Prince's Trust. <laughs> but I, didn't, I don't think, they, I don't know if they hire Americans or they can, but I would have moved to take that job because, you know, I'm, I don't know if Mark knows, but I'm a biodynamic farmer. And, uh, and the king himself is a big, is a kind of a promoter of biodynamic farming. So uh, to segue from William Blake to current events, where do you see um, the new king in, in terms of all these kinds of things we're talking about? And are you aware Mark has a video about this, Michael? I'm not. No, but you stuck on a good, uh, you struck on a great chord. So Mark, I can know he's eminently prepared to talk about this though, <laughs> but still exploring yourself. Like we're all hopeful. Uh, go Mark, I'm curious too. Yeah, look, with the big proviso that I don't actually know what's going on in the minds of King Charles. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, the, the piece um, there was, because um, Kathleen Rain, I think you can fairly say, was a sort of spiritual director to the then Prince Charles. And um, he met her when he was relatively young. And he was really struck by her, partly because she said to him, not... Um, you know, your majesty or something, um, but said, you poor boy. And um, it was like he felt seen, uh, not probably not for the first time, but he certainly felt very seen by her. And then they struck up this relationship, which um, includes lots of letters. And when Kathleen Rain died in 2003, um, Prince Charles organized uh, a commemoration service, a celebration of her life and gave the eulogy and the eulogy was subsequently published in Resurgence magazine. And it's very remarkable because he talks about his relationship with her and, and what she told him. And a lot of it is based on Blake, um, you know, broadly the Blakean realization that we've turned the world into a material possession and so have lost um, its spiritual radiance. And um, I think that whilst, you know, this has definitely informed a lot of what. Prince Charles did. I mean, there's the Prince's Trust. There's also, um, is it called the Prince's School, which is for kind of traditional crafts and so on. Mm. And then the Temenos Academy itself, um, which Kathleen Rain founded. And as Kathleen Rain put it very neatly, the point of the Temenos Academy is not to learn about figures like Blake, it's to learn from figures like Blake. And that is completely different from most uh, um, academic approaches. Um, and then Prince Charles was the key patron. Um, 
And, you know, if you give a talk at uh, the Temenos Academy, which I've done, apparently uh, Prince Charles, I don't know whether he, whether he will now he's king, but, you know, listens to them much like Jesus, the imagination of the journal gets into his hands too. Um, but um, I mean, I sense that now he's king, um, he will realize that um, he's got to play the symbolic role um, and of a constitutional monarch. Because if he doesn't do that, then he doesn't just put himself at threat, but he puts the whole monarchy at threat. Um, but at the same time, of course, playing a symbolic role is precisely a way to foster an awakening mm -hmm. um, because you awaken people to the sense that there's more than just policy. There's more than just um, economic conditions to worry about. Um, there's more than just... Um, the practicalities of life, um, even more than how you farm, even more than how you make things. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you those things become sustainable when you're in touch with that more. And so I think that he'll probably opt for a path that might frustrate some because he won't speak out anymore. Um, it'll frustrate other people who will think that he's thinking things in private, isn't he? And and so on. But I think that actually it's quite a wise strategy because if he can fully inhabit what a constitutional monarch might represent and just keep the rumor alive, if you like, mm -hmm. um, that there's other worlds that are also here, that somehow a monarchy um, without power in a political sense um, can um, help remind us of, um, I think he'll have done a really good job in fact um now that he is king and that, well, let me let me take sense. another level to this then and again i'm just thinking out loud is that you have so nova Alice, you know has that wonderful those reflections you know the king and queen well love and faith the king and queen and, and very much had a revolutionary if symbolic role for royalty you know if we could find this um so there's there's revolutionary people you know part of this podcast mark and youtube is kind of an anarchist <laughs> impulse too you know and um so we know what maybe Kathleen Rain thought, you know, but what would William Blake have thought, you know, to be in the States and watch this whole thing transpire? You know, I've got this, this notion that, um, that in some sense, the way that people were looking at the king and possibly even you struck me as what Blake would call religion or something, the disease that needs to be cured. Because Blake, again, he just didn't want it out there. You know, he wanted it in us. And I'm not claiming to, to see this clearly, but, you know, we have Kathleen Rain. We have William Blake. We have uh, go at this one more time, you know, on that. Like, couldn't William F. Blake possibly just said, like, this whole thing is so much nonsense? I don't know. No, I mean, he, he was definitely an anti monarchist. There's no yeah. two ways about it. Okay. Um, and, you know, he lived in Georgian England um, when the excesses of monarchy were all too evident. Um, and moreover, it wasn't just that people had a kind of religious deferential attitude towards it, but as he puts it, um, it was religion hidden in war, which right. was even worse. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was the Napoleonic Wars going on. And of course, he gets into trouble with a soldier at one point in his life, um, yeah. and is, you know, accused of treason. Um, no, definitely, um, you, you know, I mustn't conceal that. But I think that Blake was also, he's a very dynamic thinker. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to think that were he addressing these political questions now, um, he might see, after 200 years of experimenting with various kinds of nonconformist, both religion and um, uh, politics, um, which he, you know, related to and sort of he knew figures like Thomas Paine and so on and Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, I think that he might um, feel that the intervention that we need now is different. Um, and so, you know, he... The reason why he's an anti-monarchist, put it like this, um, so it doesn't sound like special pleading, or at least less like special pleading. Um, <laughs> is, is the, 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 reason, the reason why he's an anti-monarchist is because he thinks that we need to wait, awaken to the monarchy within us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Absolutely. He, he various phrases where he says, you know, um, you know, um, I am the, a prince of the world, um, or, um, you know, and what he means by that is um, very deeply connected to becoming aware of our own divinity. Um, and, um, you know, the human divine. And um, he, think, he thinks that in a deferential world, that gets taken out of us, as you're saying. 
um, that the deference, um, the divinity goes on to those special others, be they priests, be they royalty. Um, but I think um, certainly when it comes to, um, to uh, the, the royalty as it's now become, um, there's the possibility at least that um, a figure who's above a politics that has increasingly reached into every single part of our lives, you know, much, much more so than in the Georgian periods. I think we forget now quite easily how much um, technology particularly has enabled um, political control, but also, you know, it's political hope and aspiration too. Again, it's always complicated because pe many people do it with goodwill, but it, it shapes, you know, almost every part of our life now. And I think that um, the value of someone who symbolically absolutely not exercising power, because the minute they started exercising power would mean they got caught up in the nexus of politics, um, can remind us that um, you know, politics will not build heaven on earth. Um, and you know, much like religion will not build heaven on earth. Um, and that feels to me to be you know, valuable. Now, I wouldn't, I'm not a monarchist in the sense that um, you know, if we were starting from scratch, um, I'd be calling for a monarchy. Um, but given that in this country, at least, you know, we have this constitutional monarchy and um, the way that it's evolved, um, I feel pragmatically it's worth, um, you know, giving it a really good go because I think it can stand for these sacred things. Yeah. You're the Wonder best. That was great. No, I just love that. Go, um, yeah. You know, so the one thing that's disturbed me about the, the former prince <laughs> the king formerly known as prince is uh his over the last few years his his kind of chumminess with the world economic forum like which you know to me that was a it's a tremendous letdown because i had so much admiration for what what he was doing for such a long time for decades really um and i wonder where what blake would would how blake would see that you know, what, I'm sure he would he would not be a fan. Oh, let That's... me add the symbolic element, too, is that um, there's this this blogger, Michael and I both like, John Michael Greer. We'll have him on sometime. He writes in the U.S. under the Archdruid, I'm sorry, Eco Sophia. It's a blog. He's always kind of spot on. But he conjectures that this image of, you know, the elites kind of flying their private jets to Davos to lecture us on the environment might be the actual thing that would start a worldwide revolution, right? Because the symbol is so egregious, so horrifying, you know, the, the private jets, and then they tell the Norwegians not to eat hamburgers and so forth. Um, but just to give it like a, what Michael was saying, you know, in this kind of symbolic nugget that if, you know, we see the prince does that, I haven't followed which jets are there, but we know uh, the princes do that. They fly in, then everybody comes over to the States and lectures us that eating a hamburger is going to kill the environment. Yeah, this I'm relates sure. to two things you do well, which is William Blake, Mark, but also how these states of awareness that we began with uh, affect the way we see the environmental movement and ecology. So I think there's a lot you can offer us here. Maybe. <laughs> um, uh, I love your humility. I mean, yeah, I, I, I've been, people do say this um, about Charles and the um, World Economic Forum, and I, I half get it. But, you know, I think he's also, I think Charles is quite a pragmatic thinker. He has the vision, but he doesn't confuse that with the policy. And that's always the risk, um, which I think we increasingly run now. Um, is that we, we the, the way that I often think of it is we've got to constantly remember that heaven is not a place on earth. Heaven comes after death, whether that's the dying every day now or um, our ultimate deaths. And, um, you know, it's, it's part of, certainly part of generation to get confused with um, material assessments of what people are doing and think that's what really counts more than anything. So I, I obviously, on one level, I completely get the image of the private jets flying to Davos. But the huge risk is that you judge the world by material criteria, and then you're just in that same mess as well, thinking you're talking about spiritual things. Um, and so I, I, I half get the concern with the World Economic Forum, but I half think that if you get too worried about that, then you're getting dragged down. Actually, um, you know, this one of the one of the ways in which Blake is also um, quite um, difficult, especially with ecological crisis now. Um, it's, he's, a, he's an apocalyptic thinker. He's quite clear this world will pass away. Um, he doesn't think that this world is the world to preserve. Um, rather, 
Um, this world is the place where we can learn to resonate and know the more than this world, of which this world is a wonderful manifestation when we see it arise. Um, but, you know, dying and death, and this is one of the ways in which he's very Christian um, too, is integral um, to that perception. Now let's um, stop there. Do, yeah, do the four generations with dying and death. It's really, really good. So, you know, begin us at Oro, the way people in Oro perceive death. Yeah, so, so in, in, in Oro, uh, this is my kind of summary, you know, death is just statistics. Um, and we, we have this a lot during COVID, you know, where the news programs, the newspapers or whatever, even had kind of banners with the number mm -hmm. of people that had died that day. And um, the point about that is that I know that in a way it's trying to be humanitarian because it's trying to awaken us to the seriousness of the, of the, of the problem. Um, but um, it just leaves everybody in increasing sort of states of panic. Yeah, um, I do. One anecdote is I remember talking to a friend from college one time and he was he was mentioning back when he had the war in uh, in Rwanda and Burundi. You know, he remembered fixing his uh, muesli in the morning and watching, you know, all these bodies float down the river, you know, and that you could read a newspaper report. But he he himself felt that as numbing and even sending him further into what we would call Oro, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then so that's so death is a sort of mere statistic. Then in generation, um, that, that's where we feel the anxiety of death because we want life. Um, and so then you're caught in ever um, sort of more controlling efforts to, um, if, if, you know, ideally put death off indefinitely, which of course some people are working towards, um, but certainly to delay it as much as possible. Um, and again, you kind of saw that driving so much of the public discussion in the worst moments of COVID. Um, and, and once again, it, 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 you know, in retrospect, certainly you can see how it, it didn't really do us much good. I mean, look, I'm glad there are vaccines. I've had the vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm not saying that they're per se not bad, but when um, that kind of drive towards safety um, gets used to the point where all other factors about life start to get squeezed out and um, lost, the cult um, of safety we're also yeah. now beginning to yeah. see post COVID, you know, that mm -hmm. that's, that's the generation state. Um, and then um, though, you know, because we're, 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 we're loving meaningful creatures, we, we actually can't tolerate that. So there's the Beulah state and here is when death sort of softens and, and becomes a tragedy. Um, it, you know, it becomes something that really matters, um, hurts, um, you know, the genuine sense of loss, um, but maybe also is the moment where we most keenly know about things like love as well when someone dies. Um, in the tragedy is um, a deep experience of life um, when it doesn't overwhelm. Um, and so that would be um, the Beulah way of, of engaging with death. Um, but then, you know, there's eternity and in eternity, even as Blake puts it, what he calls eternal death is known to be held by eternal life. And by eternal death, he means that moment where you, at least I think this is what he means, you um, feel the, the possibility that maybe death is the end, that maybe it is, there is emptiness. You fear um, the void. Um, you fear the meaninglessness. Um, you know, maybe you've suffered and you've reached a point where for all you wish it were otherwise, you can't make sense of this suffering anymore. Um, but Blake says that that experience of eternal death um, will be known in eternity as embraced and held by eternal life. And, you know, this is where I, I'm cautious because I don't know that myself. I hope for that myself. And um, I, I, you know, I hope it guides me. Um, but you know, the, the, the position of faith that others have seen this, um, people like Blake, I think people like John of the Cross as well, um, who you mentioned and others, um, is that there will come a time when we'll know fully that death is a portal to the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. well, you know, um, I mean, I think and, yeah. to mention, I'm sure, I know both of you know it, but probably many of our listeners do not, is, you know, uh, in, I think it was 1827, while William Blake was dying, it took him a while he was very ill in august of i think it was august 12th i think it was uh they were sitting at his bed 
you know, at his death watch. And all of a sudden, Blake, who had been very ailing and very weak, sat up and started singing about the glories he saw in heaven. And that's how he died. And I've always held that up as uh, my model for how I would like to exit this life. Because I, you know, I've, I've learned so much from William Blake about not only how to live, but how to die. Yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful. And, um, it, you know, sometimes I think the whole point of this mortal life is to learn how to die. Um, and it's because it's not just what happens at the end, because if you wait till what happens at the end, it's probably going to be too late um to die like that but um, right. i think death is something that accompanies life moment by moment um it, partly through the way we relate to others you know so hence every kindness being a little death that sort of little um micro decenterings of ourself um but you know in other traditions they'll focus on the breath and they'll talk about the bre the breath in being the taking in of life and then the breath out being the letter going uh, letting go of life and mm -hmm. it's that pause at the bottom where something more starts to be perceived in that stillness. Um, so in lots of ways, I mean, in psychotherapy, you think about it a lot because often it's how people end things that something really important is revealed, you know, how they end the session. Um, is there kind of a momentary anxiety or can they not wait to get out of the room or whatever it might be? If you can get those moments, you can start to see how people are frightened of endings. Um, so um, in this way, you know, death, can even in this life you can start to feel how it does actually lead to more life um and uh, without having to know the tremendous things that people like william blake saw you have that video another one people could just search for is mark vernon uh to to die before dying right you know that's kind of the secret i mentioned stephen visenchy before he he has another tagline that he gave me but it's to remind people that though we die once, we're mortal every day, right? You know, and that's a way to bring in, I used to work at a Trappist monastery to bring in the Ars Moriendi, you know, to which they practice so well, to acknowledge that sleep is a little death, you know, loss of memory, you know, not to be able to conjure a memory is a form of death. But we need to make people aware of these, you know, um, super, super important. So how about, you know, one more theme, and I know you got to cut out in a little bit here, Mark. You know, I think we've touched on these four levels as they applied to, say, the material universe. We certainly wove in ecology and death. You also did one on the way the different levels, uh, Oro, Generation, Beulah, and Eden Eternity would look at freedom, you know, and because a huge theme for Blake was tyranny, you know, and so what constitutes tyranny? But I think, you know, the way you unpack it using that schema, again, is very, very, very helpful. I mean, maybe it's just worth prefacing this because this almost sure. came up. Um, I was thinking it when we were talking about Blake and politics. Please. Um, but I think he, he, he himself undergoes a development. Um, in some ways, Blake is one of these figures that has one big idea and he actually writes it down in a pithy thorn in his little book called There Is No Natural Religion, you know, very early in his life. And, and, and then the rest of his life is a kind of working out of how to express that. Um, but in another way, he does undergo a kind of development. And um, I think that um, his, his relationship um, to freedom is a bit like that, because I think for a while, particularly before the French Revolution, um, he did kind of hope for um, a political freedom that might be possible. And this is perhaps when he was associated in his early life with radicals like Thomas Paine. Um, we, we, there's not, the, the, I don't think there's really the um, uh, material evidence to. To, to back that up but you sort of sense that um and um but then i think he has a sort of personal crisis um he you know he, he he spends these three years in sussex and i guess hence the film reference there the only time he's spent out of london and at first that seemed like heaven on earth um but um things went wrong um in one way or another including this altercation with a soldier which might have led to or even to his execution but certainly a real risk of him being um, carted off to Australia, which was a terrible punishment at the time. And um, it would be. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. But so I think then he, he, in a way, you might say in one way, kind of loses faith with politics. Um, but that in itself, I think, is an awakening to um, a, a deeper sense of possibility. 
on the other side of death known fully but even now as well and so you know in the later poems particularly these epics like Jerusalem um, it's very striking that the figure of Jesus returns in fact mm -hmm. um, and um, it's in the moments of crisis that you realize that Christ is by your side um, is often how what happens in Jerusalem Albion dies actually several times in Jerusalem um, and but each time kind of Jesus is there yeah. Um, and sometimes Jesus is building a bed for Albion. And then sometimes Jesus is welcoming Albion into the clouds, um, you know, various kinds of experiences that we might have um, in moments of crisis. Um, and so the later Blake, there's much more of a sense of, you know, we need to reach beyond this world. But it's also to be found right in the middle of this world as well. It's that combination you see in Genuine Mystics, Mystics where the transcendent and the imminent are absolutely the same thing um so anyway that's a that's a a bit of a preface to this thing about freedom and important um, one. yeah uh, uh so i think freedom it's yeah you know um freedom in all row um is again it's kind of like a numerical thing um you know it's maybe like your spending power something like that um uh you're you're, you're kind of um or even again you know it's always complicated because there's there's well-meaning metrics in this um you know so the way that um, relative poverty, I think, is used um, kind of would be an all row assessment of freedom. It's not wholly bad. Um, it is trying to capture something. But of course, the trouble with relative levels of poverty is it's, it, it, it gets caught on this kind of hedonic treadmill. Um, and so the relative level of poverty constantly rises. Um, and, um, you know, it, so it actually feeds um, the consumptive way of life that's actually causing the poverty. Um, mm -hmm. So there's all row would be that um, in generation um, freedom is much more about maybe, you know, your ability to exercise your will, put it like that. Um, and so, you know, having a voice, which can be a good thing, of course, um, but also leads to culture wars because your freedom is going to compete with other people's freedom. And, um, you know, it turns into a kind of battle of wills and power, therefore. Um, then in Beulah, um, freedom is... Um, you might say the sort of freedom to give um, and the freedom to love um, and um, so um, has more of a well in extremists it would be more of a kind of libertarian feel um, and um, but even um, more modestly it would be also the freedom like the good Samaritan to kind of give away what you have for the benefit of others and that that's a state of freedom um, as well in Beulah um, I think that's that's the meaning of the Good Samaritan. It's not that he was a morally good person, but that he was a free person and so could respond to what was um, in front of him. Absolutely right. Yeah. And then but then in eternity, freedom is the freedom, not just to sort of give away what you have, but is to um, become aligned with I'm using the platonic phrase, the good, the beautiful and the true. Um, and um, that is a kind of service, of course. Um, and so. Um, at the end of Jerusalem, the emanation of giant Albion, when Albion finally finds true freedom, he actually throws himself into the furnaces of affliction, Blake says, and they in that moment turned into fountains of living waters. Um, and so it's that strange paradox that um, by giving up on your freedom, you find the true freedom and yeah. um, because you've become aligned with that which is truly free, um, which is the divine life. And we see that in St. Francis of Assisi, you know, embracing the leper. We see it in St. Vincent de Paul selling himself into slavery. Um, you know, very, very, very beautiful. And before we ask you to kind of like pitch your works and everything, Mark, um, you know, let me say that like your intelligence, your generosity of spirit, um, the clarity and everything, it's, it's really quite overwhelming to me, you know, and again, like you're the right person on Blake for this time. Michael, you know, I'm sure you have another question. No, just an observation and I, an appreciation for what Mark brought to our attention. And I think this is, a, you see this as a problem <clears throat> throughout academia there that uh, scholars want their subject to have always been static. You know, and even like Rudolf Steiner, people want him to be have always been the same person. And Blake, always the same person. But it's not, it, development is an important thing. And the William Blake of the Marriage of Heaven and Hell is a very different William Blake from Jerusalem. Not even, and it's an interesting when I look. 
I mean, I love I love the marriage of heaven and hell, but when I, when I read it, I think of myself when I was 30 and I thought I knew everything. And Blake is kind of in that register. He's always much wiser than I <laughs> ever was. But in Jerusalem, he's diff- he's he's suffered, as, as Mark said. And and I think the the key to unlocking that freedom from slavery in Jerusalem, anyway, is forgiveness. You know, and it's also forgiveness of the self, not just forgiveness of others. So, so thank you so much, Mark, for for your wisdom in in, in our conversation. You know, I, I I must add that um, I I long for these things, um, and that's why I try and wrestle with them. And that um, one of the things actually, which Blake is um, uh, giving me quite a lot of the moment, actually, which is when you think about how present, like weeping and wailing and darkness and despair um, and and all these and anger and rage even is present even in the late work like Jerusalem mm-hmm. um, and you know it's it, and often it's the figure of loss that is engaged in these you know tremendous feelings and emotions yeah. um, and loss is sometimes yeah. you know said to be the figure of imagination and, and so perhaps the closest to break Blake the person mm-hmm. um, um, you know you don't want to be too neat and tidy about it but there's something in that I think but anyway the point is that I think even at the late stage Blake knew a lot about weeping and despair and anger and um and but what's wonderful is he builds that into the this process of awakening as well and I think that there's a that maybe that's just another sort of take on freedom actually is when and, and I you know say this to myself um as a religious person um somehow I can know that that too is part of um the process yeah. Um, and so not be afraid of all that as well um, and try to avoid it and you know spiritually bypass it or whatever that's a tremendous lesson in itself so you you know obviously Michael and I can say we've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation you're a busy guy Uh, you don't have to say yes or no now but boy another conversation on the secret history of Christianity down the road somewhere uh, people would profit but uh, tell people like uh, how you would like them to approach you and your work and how to find out, you know, and how to buy your books, and again, access points for your stuff on William Blake. Yeah, look, I mean, just to say that I'd, I'd love to talk again. I love talking about these things because yeah. um, you know, it's in the sharing that um, you, you feel it as much as yeah. when you're just reading Blake on your own. So it's lovely yeah. to talk with you guys that um, that want these things too and um, have dedicated lives to them. Um, and um, and also to say, actually, just in terms of talking again, I'd be very happy to do that about Barfield, but. Um, I want you also to talk about Steiner to me. This is the deal. I'm, I'm very happy to talk about Barfield and Christianity, but I want you to talk about Steiner because for those um, you know who are listening, um, Barfield, I think, found um, his vision by his own means, but then he encountered Steiner and felt that Steiner had seen it all the more. And really odd, right? I, in so I, far I, as... I, go ahead. Steiner, I will say, yeah. Yeah, straight up. Um, but the uh, connection there can't be avoided, right? We just, we have, when you say like so many people look at Blake and, um, and don't want to see the spiritual in it, like for some of us who read Steiner and, and you know enough having read Barfield, Barfield would, wouldn't say he was like a, a drop in a bucket compared to Steiner. He was a drop in a, in a crazy gushing geyser, right? So, um, you know, Barfield scholars. And uh, so we have Steinerians who avoid Steiner's relationship with Jesus. We have Barfieldians who avoid his relationship with Steiner, you know, and all this stuff. So we'd be happy to have you on and talk about that or be on something you do. But, you know, Steiner is very important to us, you know? Yeah. Well, I'd love to tease some of that out because, I mean, in my book on Barfield and Christianity, I I have actually changed it in a second edition because it was a failure of mine, but I didn't even mention Steiner once. Um, And it was because I just didn't know what to do with it. Um, And... um, (laughs) Yeah, but, but in my slightly in my defense, also, although Barfield would say make these comments about about Steiner and his tremendousness, um, I think that Barfield's at his best when he's talking in his own way. Um, when I, he's I, not agree. To I channel, agree. When he's not yeah. trying to channel Steiner. And uh-huh. it's very rare. I feel that you find someone who you feel is talking about the same things as Steiner, but knowing it themselves rather mm-hmm. than just quoting Steiner. So that's kind of what I, that's my challenge to you. Yeah, for most anthropologists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this uh, this grouping has a bright future. Uh, Mark, a little more direction. I, I definitely want, can you promote your books? You know, the Dante one is new. Uh, people yeah, find it. Where would you like you. them to so, buy that? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I have this website, markvernon.com, where I try and make sure everything's there. Um, but, well, we could have another conversation on Dante. I mean, yeah. um, I, put, I wrote this book, Dante's Divine Comedy, A Guide for the Spiritual Journey, and a bit like trying to open up Blake, the idea is that it opens up the Divine Comedy. Um, because, again, it's very much a book for our times. I think Dante's quite clear about that. He's not the kind of culmination of the medieval period. He realised that that was already breaking down and he wanted to write for the future. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 similar to Blake in the sense that he realised that perceptual transformation is absolutely key. Um, and so that's one way of understanding the journey through the Inferno and the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. Um, and um, yeah, so anyway, um, Dante is a, a wonderful guide for our times quite as much as Blake too. Great, great. So uh, looking forward to a bright future. Thanks so much. You were traveling yesterday and you showed up today. You could have been tired, but you seemed like you were more than on top of your game. And, uh, you know, blessings upon you. And we hope you have a good day. And we thank everybody for listening to the Regeneration Podcast. We're going to see you all again uh, next week.